Hello, and welcome to Navigating the French, the podcast where each episode we take a look at a French word and try and see what it tells us about French culture. I'm your host, Emily Monaco. Today I'm chatting with Janet Hallstrand, the author of Demystifying the French. She's here to talk about a word that might not seem all that mysterious at first, but that actually contains multitudes about the French attitude towards mistakes, missteps, and being seen as wrong. Correct. Welcome, Janet. Thank you so much for joining me. Janet, can you tell our listeners a little bit about you and what you do here in France? Well, I'm a writer editor. It's I do the same thing wherever I am. <laughs> I'm a writer editor and a teacher of literature and of writing. And I think for the purposes of this podcast, the reason you wanted me to talk with you today is that I'm the author of a book called Demystifying the French which is um, a topic that dovetails very nicely with the topic of your podcast, <laughs> Navigating the French. There are a lot of good books out there about this general area, but I felt there was room for just one more in which I would sort of boil down. In I, The book is divided into two parts. One part is, is sort of five very basic tips, specific things to do or not do in France in order to get along better. And then in the second half of the book, I have 10 chapters in which I go into a little bit more detail about various things that um, sort of characterize the French and the way they are. And the purpose there was to help people understand why they are the way they are. And instead of being mystified or often even annoyed by French ways, um, they would come to understand them a little bit better and, and, and maybe just have just more understanding and sometimes compassion <laughs> instead of annoyance. And I think that what you wanted to talk with me about today is uh, comes out of the chapter called The Importance of Stability, Order, and Being Correct. Absolutely. And I think it's really interesting the way that you kind of built your book out because this list of sort of do's and don'ts, it's helpful to any traveler, obviously, because it, it helps people understand, you know, oh, this is, this is what I should do and this is why I should or shouldn't do it. But it also kind of works uh, as a, a formula that I think the French kind of embrace, which is that in France, we tend to like rules. And so that's sort of another reason why we're talking about this word correct. And it's hard because it's a cognate. So it's a word that exists and spelled the same in English and French. But there is a difference between correctness and this idea of correct. So before we kind of even delve more deeply into some of these questions, and you trace the history and the culture behind it so nicely, just right off the bat, what do you see as the difference between correct and correct? Well, I think that there are two main differences in, in the way the French use this word and the way, at least in American English, we use it. And the first one is that in, in English, when we say something is correct, we tend to be talking almost always, I think, about something that is factual. So is France a country in Europe? Yes, that is correct. Do two and two equal four? Yes, that is correct. And in French, being correct is not, it's about many things, but not most of them not factual at all. Most of them having to do with this sort of wide spectrum of behaviors that doesn't have to do with fact, it has to do with culture and tradition and, and things like that. So that's the first main difference. And then I think the other thing is that the fr French tend to have a rather narrow definition <laughs> for what is correct. And they don't sort of have this idea that there are many ways of being correct. There tends to be a correct way to do something. And that is, I think, another big difference between the French way and the American way when it comes to this word. Absolutely. And you can hear that kind of in a lot of language ticks that the French have. For example, there's a uh, Il, il ne faut pas or il faut, which is like one should, but there's not mm. even, it's, it, it's detached from the person. Il faut, if anybody has taken, you know, a little bit of French and they know that il often means he, but il faut means it is necessary or it it should be or it, it must be. It, it's a hard one to translate. Or even one of my favorites, which is uh, ça se fait pas, ça ne se fait pas. So it's, it isn't done. Right. And so there's all of these sort of language ticks in French. And you talk about one of them in your book. You hear it a lot among children, uh, so it's obvious that it's being intuited already early on. On n'a pas le droit. We don't have the right, or we aren't. It's sort of we aren't supposed to. 
I, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong from, from your book, you do have children. Did you raise them here in France? Did you hear that being said among them? And sort of how did you feel about hearing that? Well, my children were not raised in France. They came to France every summer because I was teaching a, a class, a study abroad uh, for a study abroad program at the City University of New York. And so we came every summer. So they had lots of time here. But it wasn't so much with them that I heard that. Mm -hmm. But really, in France, a lot of times you hear that. And it is, is used a lot with children. You hear children say it. You hear it said to children. But it's not just children. It's a lot of times in France, if you're looking for why something can't be done or why something can't happen, the answer is, on n'a pas le droit. One doesn't have the right. And I think that that's a pretty strong way <laughs> of saying that you shouldn't do something. And I think it's also almost automatically to an American mindset, when somebody tells you you don't have the right to do something, <laughs> there's kind of a, <laughs> a, a, like that. <laughs> a, a, just a, a knee-jerk reaction to say, well, watch me. <laughs> you know, and I think I give the example in my book that you do hear little French children saying, on n'a pas le droit. And I, it's kind of the opposite of American children, you know, doing something often that they're really not supposed to be doing and saying it's a free country. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so yeah, I think that, yeah, it, it sort of goes throughout French life a lot. I think all these things you can't do. And that, and that mention you, the idea of it being a free country is one that's really interesting to me because I got my master's in comparative 19th century French and American literature, and I found it really interesting to see the ways in which you have these two sort of nascent republics that are being built on the same, you know, Enlightenment era ideals of equality and freedom. But Americans tend to focus very, very strongly on freedom and that sort of, you know, in our language saying, oh, it's a free country. And France is, is, is a free country as well, but you don't hear people necessarily sort of leaning on that as a rationale for why they can do things in day-to-day in -day life. Right. And I think at that also kind of points to a difference in the cultures that in, I think, in, in generally speaking, the American concept of freedom has more to do with individual freedoms. And in France, there's a stronger emphasis on collective behavior, you know, societal, your sort of obligation to um, behave in a way that is right uh, for the society, the culture in which you live. Or so I guess that sort of touches a little bit on the whole notion of um, fraternité. Yeah, so I think it does point to some interesting differences in, in the two cultures. And that idea, like you said, of, of fraternité and of one person's freedom kind of ending where another person's freedom starts is something that you see just so frequently. It's not something that gets shoved down your throat in France. But I remember one time I was riding the bus and this has become like family lore in my family. When I told this story, everyone was like, yeah, that's exactly how it should be. I was riding the bus and there was this younger woman sitting in front of me on her cell phone having this very, very loud conversation. And an older woman kind of tapped her on the shoulder and said, Mademoiselle, you live in a society. And so it was like, yeah, she can talk on the phone, but also she's yelling in the middle of a bus and everybody else now has to hear her conversation. So, you know, and the thing is, what I found interesting was the woman's react, the, the younger woman's reaction to this admonishment, because as opposed to sort of fighting back and being reactionary about it, she sort of looked admonished and she was like, oh, right. Okay. Like I need to tone down my conversation or get off the bus. Like she was aware of the fact that maybe what she had been doing wasn't exactly correct. It wasn't you know, within the norms of how it is to walk through French society. Right. And, and that's a really good example, actually, because one of the things I've noticed in spending a lot of time in France is that um, you, you can notice that people around you are having cell phone conversations, but you do not have to hear the details of what they're talking about. They have a way of moderating their voices that I think is learned early on and, and you know, that they understand the importance of it. And it's nice. I mean, it, it, it leaves you freer <laughs> to have, you know, your own thoughts. Yeah. And hear what people around you are saying. Yeah. Now, I loved in your book as well, because I love looking at sort of the historical reasons why norms become normal. You mentioned this um, difference between the, the legal systems in France and in the United States, which I found fascinating. So in France, we have this Napoleonic law system, which unsurprisingly, grew out of, um, out of, you know, the Napoleonic era um, and the empire. And then in the United States, we've sort of taken on the British system, which is to 
make laws and correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, we, you know, the French basically have a list of laws and these are the ones you're meant to follow. And in the United States and in the United Kingdom, we wait until, you know, an issue arises and we make a law based on that issue. Am I getting that right? Well, I don't know. And I, I, I'm not sure if that, if, if that's the reason, the sort of historic reason. Um, but I, and I actually don't know <laughs> all that much about the Napoleonic Code myself. I was when I mentioned that in my book, I was quoting my friend Adrian Leeds, who talks about this often. And what she says basically is that the Napoleonic Code focuses on telling you what you can do. And the British and American system of law is, is based on telling you what you cannot do. So what she says, and I think certainly I've observed this kind of a difference in the behavior of, of, generally speaking, of French and American people. I mean, whenever you talk about this kind of thing, you sort of risk cultural uh, stereotyping. So I just want to say I'm aware of that. But there are these interesting sort of differences. And what, what Adrian says in the book is that because the French system only lets you know what you can do, it leaves you very uncertain as to what else you can do. <laughs> and that it sort of hampers people and keeps them from thinking outside of the box. Whereas if you're told, well, just don't do these things and everything else is fine. Her point is that that may, leaves you freer to just kind of think out of the box, think creatively, not be so afraid of making mistakes, not be so afraid of breaking rules. And I, that part, I certainly think I've observed. I think that for the French, it's their French are more worried about making mistakes than Americans are. I think it's it's more of a problem for a French person to make a mistake. They don't like making mistakes. And you find that you see that also in um, the frequency of the term, of not the f term, but the phrase, c'est pas de ma faute. Mm -hmm. It's not my fault. <laughs> you hear that quite a lot in France. And I think there's this kind of defensiveness about, you know, protecting oneself from having, from, from being accused of, of having done something wrong. And that's not true for Americans. I think we do not think of making mistakes as really a problem. It's just something you do all the time <laughs> and, and you could recover from it or learn from it or whatever. So I think that there is a really interesting difference there that Adrian was pointing to when she pointed that out. But I, like you, am curious. I would like to know more about that um, because I don't really know that much about the history of it or about the nature of the, the law. I tried actually when I'm in preparing for this, I tried looking up, you know, and I, I wasn't able to get a deep enough understanding of, of uh, what the difference in the two systems are. But that's what Adrian says it. And it, it makes sense to me. Uh, yeah, it totally makes sense to me. And I, I definitely remember, so I used to, as, as part of my first foray into living in France, I used to teach English to people. And, and one person in particular was a law professor at the Sorbonne who want, whose English was already very, very good. And he literally wanted me to sit and have a conversation with him for an hour once a week and to correct all of his mistakes, all of his foot. And he was the one who originally started talking to me about this comparative, this comparison. And I'm sure it's far more complex than this. But he sort of said, yeah, in the, with the Napoleonic code of, of laws, you basically have this list of pre-established laws, whereas in the US, you have like, oh, and it, it kind of grows out of, you know, it being um, a community of, uh, you know, I, I want to build a, a wall across my property. Can I do it? And it's like, well, let's look at the precedents and let's see what we've allowed in the past. And then we'll make a decision oh, based okay. on that. Whereas mm -hmm. in, in the Napoleonic law, they tried to imagine any possible scenario oh. where you would need a rule and they made a rule about it. Which oh, that's really <laughs> interesting. Now, see, I didn't know that. And, and actually, well, that, that, kind of makes sense too because it that means that the french way of going about creating their system of law is very abstract <laughs> yes and very prescriptivist yes and that's yeah. very french <laughs> yep yep but this very idea what you were saying about c'est pas de ma faute which you definitely hear all the time oh it's not my it's not my fault um i think what's also interesting about that too is that or in French, the word foot means fault, but it also is the word used for like a grave error, like foot grave, and it can be illegal. So, so you know, when you say it's pas de ma faute, there is like a legal implication, like sort of built into that phrasing, which I think is super interesting. Like you're, you're absolutely right. You know, we get told, you know, make mistakes, get messy. And the French are like, absolutely, please do not make any mistakes because you may be held accountable for them. <laughs> 
Right. And they're, yeah, and they're just kind of trying to be perfect, with, which of all the things that make me feel the most compassion for the French in their ways, that's probably it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Because I think that, you know, to have that burden of, of trying to do everything right is, is the burden is the right word. I mean, that who can do that? <laughs> Absolutely. We'll be right back with Navigating the French after a word from our sponsors. And now back to Navigating the French. So we have this sort of correctness in terms of, you know, navigating the world. But I think there are certain realms in which the French concern themselves with being correct. And there are, I mean, social norms or or rules that they kind of navigate almost what looks to me seamlessly. I mean, bonjour is a great one. That was the episode, our first episode of the podcast with Julie Barlow, who you featured in your book as well, talking about, you know, the fact that if you don't say bonjour, that's very not correct. And it was a big mistake that I made when I first lived here because it wasn't something that I knew. Are there other like unspoken rules of correctness, for example, just in the way that you present yourself in French society, things that sort of struck you as like, oh, wow, if you don't do this, you're being, you're, you're seen as incorrect in France. Things like dressing a certain way, maybe, or. Well, yeah. I mean, and that's a little bit more uh, vague um, than most of the things that have to do with correct. I mean, I think saying bonjour before you say anything else is absolutely the most important thing of all and, and really can make such a difference in, in the experience of a person in France. Now, it took me a while to figure that out too. <laughs> but when I did, it just changed everything. So that's the biggest one. I think one of the surprising things I learned not so long ago, I mean, I've been coming to France and spending as much time as I can here for more than 40 years now. And But it's only recently that I realized when you go to a social gathering, I don't know if this is true in every milieu or not, but for example, I live in this little village in, in um, Champagne, you know, so I go to social gatherings of various kinds. So say there's 20 people in a room when you walk into the room, you're actually supposed to greet every one of them when you arrive. You're supposed to go around and either shake hands or, well, now it's more complicated with COVID, but you're supposed to go around and greet everyone, say bonjour or bonsoir. And when I realized that when some, this friend of mine told me, <laughs> It's like incredulous, really. And these are mostly people you don't know. And she, and so she sort of laughed when she saw my face, and she said, "Yeah, that's why I always try to be there first, <laughs> right? Because then everybody else is coming around to greet you." Exactly, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, so that's one that I didn't even know about. It. And I think of that. I that's not in my book. Uh, I think I think I knew it before I wrote the book, but I figured it was just advanced, too advanced. So yeah. And then I guess well, the other place that it comes up a lot is in having to do with etiquette about um, food, for example. Is your fork in the right hand or the left hand? In, in France, it's supposed to be in your left hand. And that's kind of a good example of, I think that that's probably considered the correct way. Whereas we would think, well, you know, some people use their fork with the left hand and some people use switch it to the right when they're going to put the food in their mouth. But I think really bonjour, saying bonjour, before you say anything else is is the most important thing and and kind of in a way the hardest to remember ironically because it's simple <laughs> but it it's not instinctive for us and we have all these little these little things that i mean with with the with the greetings for example i remember i i came over here for the first time when i was 14 and i went to um 3 months of french middle school and the kids were already doing that they were already greeting each other in the in the cour de recré, recré like in the courtyard in front of the school where everyone's meant to play they're already shaking hands and doing the bees and really greeting each other so it's it's already starting when you're that young but what's the complicated and and complex thing for us as visitors or expats or or newcomers is that it seems as though there's this whole network of rules that we're supposed to already know and we break them without knowing so i'm curious as to what what do you feel that the repercussions of breaking one of those underlying unspoken rules in French society really is. Are you ridiculed? Are you looked down upon? Are you corrected? Like, does someone tell you that you were wrong or do they all just judge you quietly? What do you sort of <laughs> notice as the as the reaction there? Well, I think it depends on the person in the situation. Certainly all of those things that you mentioned, I think 
could be something that would happen. Um, in the case of not saying bonjour, for example, often when people uh, forget or don't know, they will be corrected by the person, whether it's a person, usually it's not even a person they know. It's a shopkeeper or, you know, a, I don't know, somebody that you've just asked a question, maybe a person you've asked for directions on the street or the time of day or something like that. I mean, people don't do that as much anymore because everybody carries the time around with them. <laughs> but what will happen is that there's this kind of pause and then this sort of long drawn out bonjour, which is a way of saying, I think you forgot something important. Should we back up? <laughs> Let's greet each other first. Um, and actually, when that happens to me, because I do still forget sometimes. I mean, it's I can't believe that I do, but I do. I'm actually grateful when somebody does that because then it gives me the opportunity to say, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, we oui, bonjour. I, j'ai oublié. I forgot. And, and a lot of times I'll just add I'm, a, I'm American as if that explains it, which really in a way it does. <laughs> I think the main thing repercussion is that there's there's a lack of understanding. There's a cultural gap that is unfortunate. And that's a lot of the reason I wanted to write my book because I think because what I, I what I experienced myself for quite a few years when I was first coming here for vi just visiting mainly was this this um, distressing feeling that I had done something wrong and not knowing what it was. And a lot of the times it was just starting out without saying bonjour. And it just put it makes everything go badly from that point on. Um, and then I would watch other people do that too. See, see the same thing happened to, to other people when I was sitting in cafes or whatever. And then when I was teaching my study abroad class in the summer, I would watch and also hear about anecdotes from my students. So I think the main unfortunate thing that happens is that there's a misunderstanding there. And so the, the French person is thinking, my goodness, how rude they are. <laughs> And the American, often not even knowing what they've done wrong or that they've done anything wrong, is thinking, "What? Why? It's boy, they really are kind of cold. These people, you know, what's the problem?" So there's just this ga this gap between people that is is based on a misunderstanding, and on both both sides, you know, that the the American doesn't know that you're supposed to say bonjour first. That that's really the, one of my students in one of, one of my classes. Um, once I also teach classes at Politics and Prose Bookstore in Washington, and one of my students in the class that I taught there called called Demystifying the French had spent a lot of time in France, and he said, "When you forget to say bonjour, it's almost like a slap in the face. It's it's that bad. It's it's an insult." And so there's the French person feeling insulted. And the American person feeling dismissed in some way. And none of that has to happen. <laughs> it shouldn't have to be that way. And that lack of understanding that you were talking about, I think, is a really important core piece of why we as Americans have this perception of the French as being cold or rude. And it's something that I've noticed a lot. Specifically, if you go just to like the very base linguistic level where people always complain, you know, I come to France and I try and speak French and then they say they pretend like they can't understand me or they correct me. And I think there's something really interesting in the French mindset when they're listening to their language and their language is not being spoken correctly. They almost have this like it's it's not like they're being purpose deliberately obtuse they literally can't understand you. And I think it's so interesting to watch because, for example, the bane of a French learner's existence is this masculine feminine noun issue where you don't know if table is masculine or feminine or television is, table is you know, masculine or feminine. And when you try and you mess it up, you often get this, you're, you're the person you're talking to kind of going, what? Who? I don't understand. And I remember watching my brother do this. He doesn't really speak French. He came to France. He visited me and he was asking the waiter, oh, where's la toilette? And the waiter was like, quoi? La toilette? I don't understand because in French, the bathroom is is plural for some reason. And it used to make me angry. I was like, well, he's trying. Why, what's wrong with you? Why can't you take that step and make and make an effort the way that we as Americans would do if someone who for, for whom English was very clearly their second language tried to speak to us? And then I noticed I was doing it because my ear in French is tuned to hear French spoken correctly. The French pride themselves on speaking correctly. And I, someone would make an, a gendered noun mistake and I'd go, quoi? And then I would hate myself for it. But <laughs> it's this weird thing in the way that the language is built and the way that it's spoken is that there's 
a precision to it. Yes. And any deviation from that precision is surprising and it leads to a lack in understanding, which is really what I think your book was 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 trying to get at is 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 opening that curtain for readers and trying to help us understand a little bit where the French are coming from with some of these things. Yeah, I mean, sometimes, occasionally, there is is a French person who's who's doing that. Just you know, the context is clear, and maybe maybe they're being. I have a chapter in the book called "Do They Really Not Understand Me, or Are They Just Being Mean?" And uh-huh. <laughs> I mean, sometimes, occasionally, somebody is just being mean, probably, but a lot of the time, it is 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 what you've just been saying, which is that the the precision of the language and also the difficulty of it. French is not particularly easy to pronounce, and there's all these kind of um, difficult diphthongs and vowel combinations that are hard to get right, especially for anglophones. And so, um, a lot of times, I think you're right. They just they they actually don't know what you're saying. <laughs> They're trying to figure it out. And it can be so frustrating, but really, if you, I mean, I, I remember the first time I did it to someone and I was like, oh my God, I've turned into one of them. <laughs> but but it really is this very, it, it, it's a precise language, it's a precise culture, and it does also kind of lead me to another question that you you brought up in the, in the book and the second I read it, I was like, yes, that for a country that invented the expression laissez-faire, the French are have a really hard time being laissez-faire about anything. <laughs> right. About behavior, about the right way to do things. Yeah. I think it's kind of a, 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 an interesting dichotomy, really, because they really do believe in the importance of individual liberty, but they also deeply believe in the idea of doing things uh, correctly. And they also have that, I think, a stronger, much stronger division um, in the way they judge behavior, public behavior and private behavior. And so the individual liberty part of it, I think, is <laughs> is a lot, there's a lot more laissez-faire attitude about private lives. And that comes across, for example, in the way, the different way that they view, for example, marital infidelities among politicians or something like that. Um, in the United States, it can be an issue that ruins uh, someone's political career. And in France, no, that's private. In, but, but this notion that in the public, you're supposed to behave in a way that is correct is, is important. And so I think that's where that dichotomy comes about. Yeah, absolutely. That division between public and private is very, is very interesting. And, you know, as an American, knowing that, for example, in France, you have the right to your own image, le droit à l'image. And so you can't publish, I mean, paparazzi would have no careers here in France because you can't actually publish people's images without their express permission. So you couldn't have paparazzo camping out outside. I mean, we had that one very famous image of François Hollande um, riding his scooter to his mistress's house. But that was more a question of how silly he looked rather than his (laughs) purported infidelity. We'll be right back with Navigating the French after a word from our sponsors. And now back to Navigating the French. There is something actually that 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 made me think of, and I wonder if you have an opinion on this. Um, there seems to be something, while the French are kind of obsessed with correctness, there's not that much moralizing going on with it. Like, it feels as though there's this list of rules and you're supposed to follow them, but it doesn't feel like we we harp on, you know, that sort of guilt complex that it feels like the American news media can kind of run on of you shouldn't do this because it's wrong. It's like you shouldn't do this because you shouldn't do it. Well, that's a good point, I think. And that's because there's still a pretty there's there's a lot of puritanism still very alive and well <laughs> in the United States. And not so in France. So yeah, I think you're right that it, it's more a, these discrete things that you're supposed to do to be proper. But it's not about immorality so much. And for a country that has, it seems to have very strict ways that they want things done. France historically has a very rich tradition in, you know, civil civil unrest for the for a certain cause or or revolution. You know, we're big on public manifestations and public protests. So, you know, why, where, how do you perceive that, that discrepancy between, you know, oh, this is the way that we do things, but if you don't like the way that we do things, you can take the streets 
Although even with that, it's like you can take to the streets between the hours of 10 and noon on a Saturday. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Yeah. So a nice, sort of a nice um, combination of those two things, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that that consciousness of people's rights and a sort of sense of collective responsibility to maintain those rights and insist upon them is definitely an important part of, of life in France. And I, and honestly, I don't want to get too political here, <laughs> but I think it's a good thing. And I think that, you know, in some other countries, including our own, it would be good to have a little bit more of that. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Jenna. It's been so exciting and interesting to talk to you about this, uh, this word and, and sort of what it tells us about French culture. Before I let you go, I just have one last question for you, and that is, what is your favorite word in French? Oh, gosh, I have one. What? But it's escaping me now. You're you're tricking me. Into <laughs> I can't. I do have a favorite word, and it's actually slipping my mind at this time. But it is such a beautiful language, and I remember when I was studying French as a um, as a in junior high when I you know, first started studying French, there were these three French words that I thought were so incredibly beautiful. And I thought that they would be beautiful names for girls. And they were chantage, chômage, and échatillon, which means (laughs) blackmail, unemployment, and sample. (laughs) So if you know what they mean, they probably aren't very good names for girls, but they're such beautiful words. And, and I, and as soon as this podcast ends, I will, I will remember what my actual favorite French word is, but I'm sorry. It's, it's just um, not there right now. That's all right. I love those words. I love the way they sound. And I love the fact that if you don't know what they mean, they, they do sound kind of like, you know, a trio of, of beautiful girls names. Right. Well, thank you so much for joining me. And uh, I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> This has been Navigating the French. You can find more from me, Emily Monaco, at Emily underscore in underscore France on Twitter and Instagram. This podcast is produced by Paris Underground Radio. To listen to other episodes of this podcast or to discover more podcasts like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com. Thanks for listening and à bientôt.